Welcome to week five, step four, um, developing research skills. Ooh, does that sound exciting? It does to me. Look, I, I'll admit this first, there's, it looks like I'm only going to do two sets of slides and videos for this. This first part is really trying to quantify the research skill piece. And then the second half is really, I hope you guys find this is more of a collegiate exercise, something where you have to really think about things, and it's the search for truth piece of it. And I'm going to jump around a lot on this one in and out of different websites to show you what they look like and talk about research. And again, not super exciting, but what you're going to find is a lot of your college experience is going to be writing papers. And the sooner you can get the process of how to do research and then put that into your typical thousand word, three page, double spaced paper, the better you'll get. And you may think, ugh, that's the worst thing ever. What I've found is once you can kind of quantify your, your ideas into an outline, that's half the battle. Because if you have an outline, that's a guide. And now your fingers can actually start typing. That's the hardest part, is going from this thing in the syllabus that says write about X to getting your fingers on the keyboard to type it up and turn it in. That outline is that step that can help that process out. Trust me, it works. Okay. Um, so this is going to be specifically focused on research skills, but I do want to show you a couple things um, tech time wise, starting out with how the folder is built for uh, week five. It's a little bit different than what we've seen, not hugely so. And so, yep, this presentation, the first half of it comes from presentations I've given to other colleges uh, about writing. So it's a general writing workshop. Uh, and at the end, what I've done is put in kind of a how I would write a paper. So there's a lot of slides associated with this one. But I don't think the, uh, the length of the video is going to be abnormally long in this case. So you can look through those and see what I'm talking about when I talk about thesis statement and main ideas and how they fit into a paper. But first, to, just to confuse everybody, let's do this. Okay, so here we are at the home page, right? Uh, lessons. Step four, research skills. Okay, so your standard layout here, the textbook, and this is what the textbook talks about, learning about online library. And we've talked about that uh, in a previous video. I'll mention that later in, the, uh, in this video. Here's your worksheet. Again, so we're back to kind of a normal, a worksheet, a discussion board, and a quiz for the week. Now, the discussion board is where I'm talking about deeper thinking. And it'll be associated with the next set of slides, next class video. But just to give you a little heads up on it, there's a, a set of instructions here. Watch the following videos about the documentary called The Social Dilemma. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend watching the whole thing. But we're not going to do that for this class. I want you to watch the trailer, and that link will take you to it on YouTube. And it's only two and a half minutes long, but it introduces what they're talking about in this documentary. The second is an interview, and it's a little bit longer, it's 18 minutes, but it's with two of the key contributors to this documentary. One of them was the director, and the other one was a big piece of um, the interviews discussing how social media works. And so those two videos will get you 80% of the way to being ready for the discussion board. The last, and it says open this folder, because there's something in there, so you open the folder, and there's the Word document. It's a single page, and it's excerpts from a book I read not too long ago called The Death of Expertise. And it goes hand in hand with this discussion on social media and what it's doing to our brains. So this will prepare you to go into the discussion board, right? And there's a couple little um, definitions I put here, because in the 18-minute in the, uh, video, uh, Tristan Harris uh, mentions two terms, yellow journalism and salacious, and those are kind of uncommon, so I defined them down here for you, and look, I even put where I got it, right? a little uh, citation, which we're going to talk a lot more about today. So that allows you to go into this discussion board. This one's going to be not two-word answers, and it's going to take some brain power, 
So, you know, we're beyond halfway through the class at this point. You guys are more than capable of doing this. Be objective. Be fact-based. It's really easy, and social media is one of its key things, is try to get us emotional, and all of a sudden we're ranting about this side or the other side, about them or they or who's taking my job. Okay? I want you to stay objective and answer those questions. And what I did... I posted the first one, but I didn't answer the questions for you. But what you can do, you can either copy those and paste them into your own thread, or you can open up mine and notice those same questions are right here. So you can just hit reply, and now you just look up here. You can copy and paste them, or you can just say number one and answer it. So you don't have to keep going back and forth. You'll just have to scroll up and down a little bit. And hopefully that makes it a little bit easier for you. Okay? <clears throat> and then the last thing of course the slides as soon as I finish the videos I'll post them so two sets of slides two videos class 13 I hope you like it it's more on it's not so nuts and bolts it's much more about objective thinking what's going on out there what's behind this rise of social media and the rise of polarization in our country and then, of course, uh, the quiz, which you guys will see once it becomes available. All right. So that's the first piece of tech time. Let me check one more thing real quick. We're right at the tail end of today's chat session. And everybody that's been here is kind of gone at this point. I just want to make sure nobody pops in at the last second. Looks like no. 10 o'clock has come. Leave the session. And the chat for Wednesday. I still think chat's underutilized, folks. It's the easiest way to ask questions. Where was I? Oh, yeah, I was at Smiley Face. As I said, this was a presentation I've given numerous times. Um, so any good presentation, hint, hint, you guys are doing at the end of the class, has an agenda, an overview, some kind of, here's what we're going to talk about today, folks. And then some of the basics about writing, this thing called APA, and actually, APA, I'm going to talk more about a thing called MLA. These are formats of how to write, and different instructors or different schools may mandate using APA or MLA. And if you've never heard of them, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about that today. Um, from what I've seen, GNTC generally uses MLA. Um, when I was at UTC for my doctorate, they wanted APA, fine. It's harder. I think MLA is the easier one to use. So that's what um, I would expect your instructors to uh, ask for. So in this class, we're not going to write a three-page paper. I'm going to have you do a presentation and send that in because uh, you're going to get plenty of writing as you go through school. That's why we're talking about it here. The idea of expository writing and expose, you're telling a story. You're explaining something. And there's one other out there that I'll just mention when we get to it. It's called an argumentary, pa argumentary paper. Is that right? Ah, it's still early. The writing process, the research process that precedes it, really, and a couple outlining examples. Okay. So what are you writing about? You can't write intelligently about anything without knowing something about it. Now, it may be a topic you're intimately familiar with. And sometimes the uh, instructors will say, uh, write about whatever you want. When we get to the end of this semester in our class, the presentation you develop is on any subject you want, which can make that a little bit easier. But sometimes you're assigned, here's what I want you to write about. It's kind of endemic to the class, like history. There's things we write about to uh, increase our knowledge. That's part of the idea, write about something. So you got to actually read research it. And I'll step you through. I borrowed a community college's um, steps for research because I think it's as good as any so why recreate the wheel the title of the assignment sometimes people bog down on the title what am I gonna call it don't spend too much time on that that'll come to you as you start putting ideas on paper so don't bog down there but the thesis is critical what is it the thesis is the overarching idea that you're writing about that I don't want to call it main point because you're gonna have two or three main points that support the thesis. It's the main idea. It's the overall focus of the paper. Okay, So just to clarify, not to split hairs, but it provides a focus. And if you don't have a thesis, 
and the thesis statement goes very uh, comes early in the paper without it you can go immediately off the tracks you can lose your focus on what was I supposed to be writing about here okay so that is important the title not so much right off the bat don't don't bog down on that so dissect it this you're gonna see this slide again at the end where I do a, a breakdown of how I would dissect this assignment this comes from a history class of mine the idea that um, the results of World War one set the stage uh, for the outbreak of World War two in a way the outcomes of World War one there was a, a period of time with a depression a worldwide depression and then the beginnings of World War two they're almost connected because of the way World War one ended and so here's the assignment that you would see typically in a syllabus, right? Write me a 700 to 1,000 a, a word. Usually I just put a 1,000 word. And for me at least, I'm not a word count Nazi. <laughs> I shouldn't use that term with the World War II discussion. But, you know, if you can explain that in 850 words, great. If it takes you 1,200 words, okay. It's kind of a window, at least in my mind. Now, if you start going to the 2,000 word, too long. You're, you're putting too much detail in. If it's 400 words, it, it doubtful that you explained it sufficiently. So use that. 1,000 words should put you in that 8, 850 to maybe 1,200 word count, something like that. right? And, you know, each instructor is going to be different. There are some out there that say, I don't want 1,001 words, period. So know what the expectations are. So there was the question, right? It's in purple. Two scholarly references, most of the time I ask for three um, because the textbook can be one of them and the others you're probably going to get off of the internet which is okay as long as they're objective. Format per, this one I wanted APA, um, but you notice on this the, the main points are not spelled out. So you go, oh man, how am I going to do this? Well the first thing to try to do is come up with a thesis statement. What am I writing about? And the easiest way I found to do that is just take old purple here and change it into a statement because that's the research question. How the outcomes of World War One connected to the origins of World War Two in Europe. OK, the outcomes of World War One directly contributed to the start of World War Two. You can reword it a little bit because X, Y, Z. Those would be the main points. OK. That's a start. Now I know what the thesis is because I changed the research question into a thesis statement. But now what do I have to do? Now I have to start digging into something and come up with main points one, two, and three. So that's where I start the research because now at least I have a vector on what I'm looking for. Okay? And I do a generic outline. Any paper I ever write, I kind of go like that. Intro, and then I'll flesh it out with some ideas. And we'll get to that at the end. Main points. And not just main point one, but sub points, two or three sub points, data, information, writings that support that main point. It's the details that make main point one realistic, viable. And then you conclude. And the conclusion looks an awful lot like an introduction. The introduction, you're saying, here's what I'm going to talk about. The main points, you talk about it, you write about it. All right. And then the conclusion is kind of a restatement of the introduction, but now I've gone through and given you main points one, two, three. Now I've proved my thesis. And in conclusion, it's kind of like a closing argument in court because of X, Y, and Z. World War II, the start of World War II is clearly affected by the outcomes of World War I. End of paper. All right. So sometimes we make a mountain out of a molehill. And just like anything else in life, the more you do this, the better you will get at it. Trust me. Yes, it sucks, I know. But the, the, um, that Zagarnik effect, the longer you put something off, right, instead of working ahead of time, it's important because this is 25% of my grade in this class, not in our class, but just generally. Don't put it off to the last minute where now it's important and urgent and I have to rush and it's a piece of crap and I get a 50%. Or the other thing I've seen is when uh, students get behind the power curve and the paper's due in three hours, they are so tempted to cut and paste. And now you get busted for plagiarism, which we'll talk about as well. That's the worst outcome because you're going to get a zero. And you do it a few times, you're going to get thrown out of the school. And I've seen that happen, believe it or not. It's not frequent. People kind of get the idea. 
Look, plagiarism used to be you had to go dig into books and see if people were copying stuff. Now it's a computer program that tells me you're plagiarizing in about five minutes. And in fact, it'll show me what was plagiarized and where it came from. There's no way you're going to get away with it unless your teacher's just lazy and doesn't check for it. I don't want to run that risk. Take the time, write about it. Hell, learn a few, sorry, <laughs> heck, learn a few things about the subject. So basics. Yes, do this. Clear, concise, and accurate. Don't play loose with the facts. Find out the data. Um, when writing about the lead up to the Civil War, how many Southerners actually owned even a single slave? You'd be surprised what the number is, but you want to look that up from a facts-based um, article or website and put that in the paper if it's you know one of your main points. Is it dry? Maybe. It's not the next great American novel, right? And that's one of the no's you're going to see on the next page. Just make it facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Okay? Focused on the thesis with supporting information that go to that thesis. And you're going to get lots of feedback. When I do, I do in all my other classes except for this one, I have students write a thousand word paper. One, in one course, I'll have the topic given. I'll give it to them. The other one, I let them pick it. Okay? So you will get feedback. Look at that feedback and do it better the next time. And you will get better at writing. I promise. So no, flowery. Most people start out their writing, their collegiate writing career, taught, or writing like they speak, which is overly the words verbose, because we tend to talk a lot. So again, go back to that clinical, just the facts. Don't get emotional. Don't go off on tangents and rants. Look, if it's an opinion piece, okay. But if you're doing an expository, an expose, I'm telling you a story about something, then it shouldn't be a populist rant or the next great American novel. You can write that on your own time. <clears throat> so basic formatting. One of the things you can use, and I do this, is use Word, Microsoft Word, or I think Apple uses Pages, and even the online version of Word that's in Office 365 that you can get from the school has now just added this ability. Um, and I'm going to explain this and cut out and go to some examples. But Word, you can define what kind of format you want. There's a little drop-down menu, and you click MLA. And now Word goes, okay, I know what the format is, and we'll help you do that. Okay? You can also use Word to build citations and references. Those little, the citation is the shorthand parentheses in the body of the paper, and the reference is the full-blown, here's where I got the information. And why we do that, I'll explain too, okay? In Word, it'll show you typos, grammatical errors, those red and blue underlines that you've probably seen. Right-click on it, and Word will tell you, hey, bonehead, this is spelled wrong. The one thing Word won't catch all the time, at least, is the wrong word used in context. And the one I use, you know, whether or not you think this is right. And you spell it whether, W-E-A-T-H-E-R, like with the weather outside. Sometimes it won't catch those, right? So that's where proofreading yourself still helps. And you can use Word to uh, check your spelling and grammar. Heck, I think it comes automatically set up that way, right? So let's jump out, go to Word, and I'll show you that. And while I'm at it, I'll try to save a little bit of time here. I'm going to show you a couple examples. There's this thing that the GNTC uses that they almost got rid of, and I was one that petitioned to not get rid of it. It's called Turn It In. And it's an online plagiarism checker. Really what it does is it checks for your paper, goes out and searches the internet, and says this big chunk came from an article on the internet. It's not plagiarism if you cited it properly. But it helps, in my mind, students can look at their own papers, review it, and you go, ooh, there's a big section and I didn't cite it like I should have. So now you fix that, and you turn it in again, and now you haven't plagiarized. Okay? Yeah. So here's a couple examples talking about plagiarism. Here's the first one. It's been sanitized uh, to protect the innocent. This is from a class, an older class. It's been a while ago now. But talking about anti-communism and McCarthyism, the 1950s, the Cold War, the fear of the Soviet Union. Okay? And what you see is these big, large red areas. That means I found this. I turn it in, found this on the Internet. So that's a pretty big section there. And probably this student should have cited. What does that look like? Well, the next one, this blue section, 
look, it found the same thing. It found a big chunk of the paper on the internet, but notice what she did. Author, date. This is APA format, okay? And I'll explain the differences in, here in a little bit. But that's cited. That means that's not plagiarized. She's given credit to the author. Brinkley wrote that. So, you know, once in a while, if you miss one, it's not the end of the world. But in general, if you see big chunks of the same color, you should see something at the end that looks like this. This one came from the New York Times. So again, not plagiarism. Okay? If you see quotation marks, there should always be a citation because you're using somebody's direct words. And she used a little bit different format here, but who'd she give credit to? President Truman. So not plagiarized. Right? And the overall number on this, again, New York Times, you can see. Sometimes it doesn't catch it. She used this out of the Brinkley textbook. And then the end's just kind of your citation or your uh, reference page, which gets kind of muddy looking, so don't worry about that. But up here, when the report comes back, you're going to see some sort of number. And so this paper said 36% matched what's out on the Internet. It's not a plagiarism number because she didn't plagiarize. She put in her citations. And so it depends on your instructor. But generally in my classes, I don't want to see anything, you know, as you get up toward 40%, that's a lot. But some of these topics you don't know a lot about, so you want to bring in expert opinion. So to me, 36% is a, that's a perfect number, right? She used a lot of expert opinion, but there's a lot of her own ideas in this as well. So that's a good paper. Let me show you an example of another one. Okay. First, the first thing that jumps out or should is that, right? Oof, 97%. That means like two things in this paper weren't not plagiarized again, but not um, the author's original ideas. So let's take a look at this one. This thing's a peach. Uh-huh. There's two words. So that's like gave him his 3%. So you notice this is all green. And let me blow it up for you because this one took a minute. I looked at this and then you go, well, there's a citation. There's another one. Well, come to find out, one of the things Turnitin will allow you to do is click on the red section. And when I did that, it took me to a paper. So this guy, it was a guy in this case, actually copied and pasted the entire paper to include the citations that the original author had put in. So this is plagiarism in its extreme Right, so he got a zero, he got, uh, don't do it again. Um, and look, this guy, I saw him right uh, in his last couple classes before graduation, and he told me, he was honest about it, and I appreciated that. He said, I'd been doing this for quite a while, and none of the instructors ever bothered to check it. You were the first one to do it, and I never did it again, right? So kind of a, yeah, I was an ogre, but it stopped him from doing it. Because had you continued, there's another guy that, and it's always guys for some reason, had it got caught, did it again, had to uh, kind of beg for reinstatement in the school, and then he did it a third time. Ay, and that meant, see you later, pal, you're out of here. Because schools can't accept, oops, sorry, schools are not going to accept you writing or copying and pasting stuff because that undermines the school's credibility that we're graduating people that don't know anything because they've been plagiarizing the whole time. That's no good. You're supposed to learn something by writing a paper. Okay, while I'm with Word, and I apologize here, I can't really make this part any bigger. I can zoom this up so you can see it better. But talking about references, if you go up on Word, I think you can see that, okay, references. Click that tab. And what it's going to do, it's going to open up this section is the one I use a lot citations and bibliography citations and references right? bibliography another name for it and you notice right in the middle there's a style and if you click the drop down box look it shows you how many different styles are out there holy moly and again these are all just formatting styles so if you're going to write a paper in APA you would click that if you're going to do it in MLA that's what your instructor wants click MLA and now Word will do what it needs to to make sure the formatting is correct, right? So one more thing, and I know this is kind of in the weeds, but man, I promise, I've done this in my high school classes, and they're all like, geez, I wish somebody would have told me this before. It's the citation piece. So this, insert citation, just click on that. And if you're going to write a paper, the best thing to do is, okay, I've got my thesis 
right? World War One, World War Two. How are they connected? Now start digging into it. And when you come up with your, <clears throat> excuse me, three or four different references that you're going to use in the paper, have them laid out right next to you. And even before I start writing the paper, I'll plug them into Word. So I'm going to add a new source. All right. And again, I know this is small. But up here at the top, what kind of source is it? Book, section of a book, a journal article, a peer-reviewed article. What you're going to use a lot of? Websites. And as you click this box, it changes this part down here as to what you need to fill in. Right? So let's just do a quick example to save time. Let's call it a book. And as you click on each of these boxes, notice down here it says example. This is how you would type it in. So author, see how it says Kramer James, last name, first name. So look down there so you do it right. So I'm going to make myself the author. Breaky Mike. All right. And the title is I Hate Writing. Year. It was published in 1999. Right, I'm making this up. City, uh, let's say Dalton. It's easy to type. <clears throat> and the publisher, Penguin Books. Right. That's all you need. Medium, I generally don't fill that one out. You don't have to fill everything out. And you say, OK. Now watch what happens on the paper that's on the screen behind it when I hit OK. That's where the cursor was. Notice. It thinks you want to plug that in right now. Well, I don't. I'm just adding that into the Word document. So to get rid of it, you just backspace a couple times, and it goes away. All right? And so I'm just going to do it up here at the top where there's not so much gibberish. Yeah, I'm a typing machine. There's your red line of death, so just right-click. Yeah, I think you mean this. Yes, you're right, Word. Okay, students hate writing papers. Let's say that's a concept in my book, but you're using your own words to describe it. It's called paraphrasing, but you still want to give credit to the author. So put it at the end, then you go up here, you go insert citation, and now see what's there? That book I put in. And so if you've put in your three or four sources, you just pick the, the one of those three or four and click it, and it'll insert the citation for you. All right? Now we're going to go down in the weeds one more level just to bore the crap out of you. But let's change this. I'm going to change one thing on it. I'm going to make it a quote. <clears throat> when you do that, I said any quote. You see quotation marks you must have a citation. Who said it? So that's what I wrote in my fictional book, Breaky, right? But now i got to add one more thing. Hit the citation, hit this little drop-down box, edit citation, because when you have a quote, you need a page or a paragraph number. Where did it come from? So on a website, you're probably not going to have pages. Just go ahead and count. One, two, three. It was in the third paragraph. If it's a book, it's on page 17. It's right there in front of you. Okay, 17. Okay. There you go. And it adds the page number. So that helps. And now one more thing. And this is going to be kind of a poor example because I don't have three or four. It makes it look better. But now that I have that info in there, at the end, hit bibliography. And just pick which one. Most of the time people use references. And it's going to build a reference page in the proper format in MLA for you. Right. Cool, huh? Yeah, I know. It's a lot of kind of minutia. But I swear this will help. And look, you can go back and, and watch it again. But the references tab in this section here can make your life very much easier when it comes to citing and referencing. Let's get rid of those two examples. Again, 36% in that case was a good one. Okay, still in kind of the tech time mode, let's look at a couple of these websites that are the uh, blue stars. The first one I had on there is Grammar Check. And the reason I put these in there is there's other things online besides Turnitin where you can submit your paper and have an online check for plagiarism, for typos, for poor grammar. 
things like that. So these are out there, and I just want to kind of show them to you so that you're aware of them. Paper Raider, another one, free to use. Here's one. Bookmark this at some point in your life. The Purdue Online Writing Lab, known as the OWL. This has so much information about all those different formats, MLA, APA, how to cite, how to reference, how to write a bloody paper. Um, it's a fantastic resource. I still use it all the time. Right? And while I'm up here, we've talked about this before. It comes up later in the presentation. <laughs> nice picture. Uh, that ProCon website, part of Encyclopedia Britannica, but it was one where you could look at, if you're writing now an argumentative paper, looking at the pros and cons of an issue, that this is a great resource to go into and look at. All right, I think that's it for tech time. So let's keep driving. Those are what the blue stars, they take you to those websites I just opened up. Turn it in, you will see it as a folder in your class when you have a paper due, and you turn it in through that folder. Right, it's fairly simple. Um, as far as using the, the library, the research piece, I'm not going to regurgitate what I said. What I would do is, if you forgot, or not a lot of people watch Class Video 5, I'll tell you that much, uh, about the 29 minute mark or so, I went through an electronic search of the GNTC library, and we used the fictitious topic of legalizing marijuana. And when you type that in, we got 40, I forget, 480,000 results. Holy moly. And that was through Galileo, the school's online search function. But then we started typing in more specific words. Um, legalizing medical marijuana. It shrunk. Legalizing medical marijuana in Georgia. It shrunk again. And then we refined it down to a couple years worth, the latest legislation on it. And we got down to 20 articles, which is a doable thing. And then instead of reading all 20, which will still take hours and hours, is you go and read that abstract. So you click on the article, one of the 20, and the abstract is a single paragraph that explains the guts of the paper. And you go, yep, that's what I need. Nope, I don't need that one. And I can read 21 paragraph summaries in minutes as opposed to hours, right? I swear the only people that call me anymore are telemarketers. And I thought that was illegal. Eh, anyhow, uh, moving on. These are links as well. I talked about the free dictionary way back in probably video two, the introduction to the class. Uh, there are places for dictionaries, look stuff up, find definitions, and those can be cited just as well. You saw, I think, uh, uh, on that discussion board that I had cited a couple places. And then that pro con we just looked at. It's an excellent resource when you're looking at pros and cons of a specific subject. APA, MLA, similar and simpler. That's why I think more people are moving toward MLA. Just some, some things to think about. Don't use jargon. Don't use terms people won't understand. Don't be wordy, both alike. Just say they're alike. In close proximity, they're close. Right? You're being verbose in that case. And when you use acronyms, you can, in academic papers, use acronyms. But the point is, spell out what you're um, going to use an acronym the first time. So in this example, Special Operations Forces, SOF. And now for the rest of the paper, all I have to do is type SOF. But you don't want to put in an acronym without explaining what it means. Because if you put in GM with no explanation, that could be General Manager, it could be General Motors. We don't know. All right. So that's why you define it the first time through. Colloquialisms, they're like to skin that cat or on the other hand. They're kind of common phrases that we use when we speak but use a more academic term. There are several ways to solve that problem, not skin that cat. But I bring that up sometimes and people think it's weird. That was a very common turn of phrase when I was growing up. Okay? But they can be misinterpreted. You want to avoid these two things, you and we. Because when you use you, it's like, who's you? Who are you talking about? So it's an easy solution. Instead of saying, you know, we, the example here down at the bottom, they both work the same way. We should be sick of all the negative campaigns in our election, right? That second person or the royal we. Well, just change it to who you're talking about. Americans should be tired of negative campaign ads in U.S. elections. Now you don't use that. 
So who's the you you're talking about? Citizens, students, teachers, whatever it is. Just change it to that. It's easy. We is the same. Same idea. Um, just watch this. This is an easy one. Look, I get caught with this as well sometimes. Um, he, she, right? Americans, they. It's plural. There's more than one of them. Consumer, singular, would be he or she. So just make sure that those match. Singular to, uh, to plural. Easy for me to say. If it happened in the past, it should be past tense. And you see this really easily in historical uh, papers because everything they're writing about, the election of Abraham Lincoln, it all happened you know, years ago. So it all should be past tense. Right? Lincoln isn't speaking. Lincoln spoke. Uh, pretty straightforward. But again, easy to miss. That's a big word, isn't it? Anthropomorphism. What it is is you're giving human traits to an inanimate object. So here's an example. General Motors thinks that you know electric cars are the way of the future. In fact, Ford certainly is thinking that, right? But Ford doesn't think. Ford's a company. The leaders of, the management of Ford believes that electric cars are the way of the future. See the difference? It's not the company. It's the people within the company. That one takes some practice to recognize. Can you use I in an academic paper? Sometimes I hear instructors, you can't never, uh, no, no. The thing is, if you're writing and it's your opinion, say one of the main points that's asked for is give your opinion on X. Then to me, using I, because it's your opinion, is perfectly acceptable. Right? I don't want to bog down on that. Citations and references. <clears throat> what I see sometimes is you'll get a paper and there's no citations in the body. Remember the little parentheses with the author or author page. But you get to the end, and the reference page has 16 references. Okay, what that is, is just trying to say, look at all the references I used. Mm, yeah, that's usually BS, is what it is. Because that reference page, if you used it in the paper, it should have been cited in the paper. So one of the things I look for is a, a citation, and then I go to the reference page and say, yep, it's on there. So citation and reference should match. And you only have to use it once for it to be on the reference page. Often you'll use it two, three, four times. And just as an aside, while I'm thinking about it, in a thousand word academic paper, you should probably have three or four references. Look at what's mandated by the instructor. But I would guess somewhere in the realm of seven, eight, nine, maybe up to a dozen citations in the paper. And those can be quotes. In fact, quotes have to be cited, right? Um, or they can be where you paraphrase. You take the author's ideas and kind of put them in your own words, but it's still their ideas. So go ahead and cite it. And if you're in doubt, cite it. It's better to cite a couple times too many than not enough. Right? So technically, if it's not accurate or they don't match it, technically that's plagiarism. Now early on, you'll probably get just a don't do that again, but you want to avoid the plagiarism bug. Okay? And, you know, I showed you some of that. Word, Grammar Checker, some of those websites can help. Um, so you turn in your paper and when I do it I set it up where students can see the results of the plagiarism check remember it's really not that and they'll go oh I missed that and you can go back and go okay that was who was that that was Jones was the author you put in your citation save resubmit stay out of plagiarism jail no problem and those examples we looked at <clears throat> excuse me look I, again I know this isn't super exciting these are APA formatted and but MLA is about the same so this is a paraphrasing of this work by Murphy so in APA author date if this was MLA it would just be Murphy now <laughs> here's one more thing to queep no period until you finish the citation citation period so don't have two, and don't put the period here. You put it at the end of the sentence, which is the citation. And this would be what the reference page would look like. Okay? This one, a direct quote. See the quotation marks? So we know it has to have one. And in this case, this is two authors, Christensen and Eyring. MLA wouldn't have the date. It wouldn't have the P, but it would have the six. So Christensen and Eyring, six for an MLA formatted. And again, what you see here is what it would look like on the reference page on the bottom, underneath it here. Okay? And that's what I said. I just said that. That's what they would look like in MLA format.
That's why I think MLA is easier. It's more straightforward. So citations should match references. Why do we do this? To make your life miserable? No, well, sort of, okay. <clears throat> but let's say I read your paper, and there's a citation, and there's something I find really interesting in the paper. So I go to the reference page, and I can find exactly where that article came from, and I can go and find the actual article and read it myself. That's why. The other reason is it gives credibility. When you bring in expert opinion about the Cold War or about the Civil War, about any topic, it bolsters the credibility of your paper, and that's a good thing. All right, this is the, the piece I talked about from North Hennepin Community College, the link there if you want to actually go to the website, and the basic steps of research. And I'm going to kind of speed through this because you can read it. I don't have to read it to you. But it should make sense. So what's your topic? Sometimes it's given to you. Sometimes you have to pick it yourself. Okay? And sounds like the pre-writing process. Hold that thought for just a minute. They're similar, but this is the research part that precedes your writing. Yep, maybe given to you. Okay? Change the question into a statement. That's what we did at the beginning. The outcomes of World War I affected the move to World War II because of bam, bam, bam. These three things. And that's what I had to do research on. Now you start digging for those X, Y, and Zs. Okay? Same applies if it's the topic that you're picking. Whatever it is, um, the death of expertise and how social media affects our relationships. Let's say how you, you wanted to write about that. Now you have to um, find those X, Y, and Zs, some supporting information for those main points. Okay? And this should have some kind of vector to it. The death of expertise in social media are negatively affecting our relationships. Ba -ba -ba -ba, thesis statement. Now you get information to support it. Two and three, preliminary. Um, this is where I would do that library search, where you kind of take or don't take given articles based on the abstract, right? not reading the entire 20-page article. Is there enough information? Boy, I can't think of too many. Um, topics that wouldn't. In fact, it's often too much. I would say 99% of the time it's too much. That's why you have to whittle them down. Make the search criteria specific and look at the abstracts to get the two, three, four best articles that talk to your thesis. Okay? Locate it. That's It's in the electronic library. Most everything research-wise. I used a few books in my dissertation, but almost all of it was either uh, journal articles or web-based material so it was almost all online okay. save your references um, there are folders in different electronic libraries where you can just hit you know that's a good article hit save put it in that folder and now it's there you don't have to remember it oops <clears throat> If, I'm not going to go back to it because this is a little, it would just drag this out too far. But there is, based on the article you pick up, if you scroll to the very bottom of the page, very often it'll say, here's how to cite and reference this in APA, in MLA, and you just copy that and stick it in your paper as far as the reference goes. So that's another way to make sure the, the uh, formatting is correct. Evaluate your sources. This is going to be really when we... We get into the next video and the next bunch of slides what's out there that is credible that is objective and if you remember the acronym cars from way back when credible accurate reasonable and there's supporting information that goes with it it's not a blog it's not CNN right because you know Fox and CNN are none of those things right is it the New York Times that leans to the left it's a liberal newspaper but the editorial process of reviewing information keeps most of the BS at bay. Or is it InfoWars, right? That lunatic. What is more credible when looking at smoking and lung cancer? Let's say that was going to be your topic. And we'll, we'll drill down on that just for a minute. Um, who's more credible? Dr. Cheesy from the American Lung Association, who's written multiple medical journal articles about lung cancer, or Dr. Wheezy, who works for Philip Morris International. And if you're not who, sure who Philip Morris International is, look it up. The answer is Dr. Cheesy is the more uh, objective, more credible source. Dr. Wheezy's working for the tobacco industry. And they're out there, folks. 
five and six kind of wrapping up make notes um, this is where it helps um, what the articles are and maybe start building that basic outline because we're still in the research mode right digging up information now it's time to write to vomit on the page that'll make sense here in a minute have you built an outline do your main points support the thesis or do they go against it maybe that's not a very good source largely you want to go from general down to specific and I guess I should do it this way general to specific you start out with the more general and then go more specific okay and outlining and I'm telling you outlining it's the best it helped me immensely okay site and prof or format this is kind of the proofreading piece we've been through this so I don't need to do it again and then I promise you proofread it one last time this gets into the writing process if you can write it and let it sit for a day or two and you go back and read it you're gonna find mistakes I promise and my poor wife had to read my 250 page dissertation more than a few times and she always found something wrong because she's looking at it from our different perspectives so she's reading it she goes what on earth do you mean by this and I reread it and I go boy you're right that's just that's not clear at all and so I go back and rewrite it okay so proofread you get a friend to proofread it that's a sure way to piss them off um, so here's an example I said we do we're gonna do two of these the second one will be quick you can do it kinda on your own in the slides let's say you wanna write this is a you pick the topic and you wanna write about the effects of smoking on the lungs that's super broad you're gonna get 40,000 results when you do a search for that so now narrow it down and so I just kinda developed this can we be more specific smoking and its effects on developing lungs still too many smoking effects on preteen lungs better but still too many how about the top three negative effects of smoking on preteen lungs Ooh, now we get down to the 20 25 30 results that's a more doable thing and if it's still too broad what you can do is go for the top two effects or maybe the singular worst effect of smoking on developing preteen lungs now you've got a very specific topic right and you can pull up data information surveys results tests uh, to support that okay. so maybe that would be ultimately the most damaging effect of tobacco smoking on preteen lungs maybe that's your thesis right so jumping from and they're not dissimilar but now that I've done the research now I can start the writing process and so we've really covered this right the thinking reading research you have got that done hopefully you've organized some of your thoughts into that outline so you've got a flow of information if you're writing about a historical topic chronology works really well you know when did it start you go from the 1820s to the 1850s and kind of write as the time clicks off it makes it very organized then we'll spend a little bit more time on the last couple okay so yes we've been through this part the pre-writing the reading and research here's my generic outline again main points one two and three and then I'll even put in sub points info data facts and there's other ways to do it I like this myself you can use note cards and have each main point on a note card if you remember the spider chart from skimming chapters that's where it came from what's the thesis and the legs of the spider were the main points one two three four okay so there's different ways of doing it find what works best for you and use it okay and here's where you vomit on the page that's where now I've gone through I know what I want to write about I've done the research I've built an outline now my fingers start flying on the typewriter okay don't go back and fix mistakes I'm guilty of that I see a red line I'm like oop better go fix it and that kind of interrupts your chain of thought as you're going so just vomit on the page Blah, right once that's done and maybe every you know paragraph or two you can go back once I vomited on the page I've, I'm stream of consciousness I got my ideas on paper now I can go back and fix the mistakes because they're gonna be clearly there for me with red lines of death and man when I'm typing I'm a horrible typer it's like more red than anything else but it's easy to go back and fix okay? so do that type then fix and proofread I just talked about this can you let it sit for a day or two you'd be surprised you read it out loud it sounds different coming out of your mouth you go oof that doesn't sound right and you can catch it that way those online sources have your poor suffering wife proofread it for you okay and then the last step is turn it in right? or maybe you're gonna present it somewhere or publish it 
<clears throat> I think I've mentioned this enough. The expository, the tell a story, you're explaining something. But the basics of writing and presenting are the same. Tell me what you're going to tell me, the agenda. Tell me the body, the main points of the presentation. Tell me what you told me, conclusion, summary. Here's what we talked about. And that cements it. So I tell you what I'm going to tell you. Here's the agenda. Now the audience is primed for those are the things he's going to talk about. You talk about them. And then at the end you go, here's what we talked about today. And that kind of helps cement it in their brain. Simple. <clears throat> what am I trying to explain? How can I categorize? How can I organize and present the part so that it makes sense? Look at the chain of events. Look at the timeline. Right? Sometimes we confuse those. You don't want to jump around in history because it makes it confusing. <clears throat> in the intro, getting to the finish line, so hang in there. In the intro, you want a couple things. One is the thesis statement. Here's what I'm going to write about. Okay? Not in those words, but that's the point. Start with an attention grabber, something that makes the reader want to continue to read. And for the thesis, we did that, right? You change a research question into a statement. There it is for you. And then a preview of the main points. And I got those because I've done the research. I think this will make more sense when I get to the little color coding thing. And again, don't struggle with the title. Um, it'll come to you. And once you've written the paper, you'll probably see it. Right? And you can maybe distill down the thesis statement. World War I led to World War II. It's not a horrible title. It's just off the top of my head. Okay? Main points. Get those main points. And I use a rule of thumb on five plus or minus a couple, plus or minus two sentences per paragraph. If you look at your paper, it's all one paragraph. You've got all your main ideas all <clears throat> scrunched together. So look for super long paragraphs. Try to break them up. And even if it's writing about main point one, that doesn't mean it all has to be one paragraph because each sub point may be a paragraph unto itself. And should should yes the answer is yes do the details support the thesis if you're writing about the Civil War being unavoidable each of your main points should point back to that unavoidable thesis the war was unavoidable right? you don't want one that says hey we could have avoided this that goes against your thesis I'll explain this more in a minute it's kind of icing in the cake the transition sentence whoops ah, he's out of control um, and then the conclusion reflect back to the thesis. The Civil War was unavoidable because of bam, 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 which I've talked about in this paper. I wouldn't write it that way exactly. That, you know, closing argument in court. The underline, do not put new ideas in the conclusion. Because you haven't explained them in the body, so they don't belong there. Okay? So a couple examples, and this wraps us up. This is one, not one you're going to see in our, in our class. How do World War I affect American ideas about tolerance and liberty? The reason I use this one is, look, the main points are given to you. They're bulleted. So you don't have to do, the, you just have to do a little digging on those points. You don't have to come up with them. So that's an easier paper to write. And look, the last bullet is in your opinion. So that's where that I think can come in. Okay, it should come in. And in this case, it was APA with three references. So there's your typical syllabus assignment. Here's another one. This one does not, remember this, this I put at the beginning of the presentation, does not have your main points spelled out. So now I'm going to have to dig them up. All right, so here's where I go color-coded. And again, I'm going to blast through this, but you can go back and look at it. And I've given these slides out to a lot of uh, students, and they say they find them really helpful. So I color-coded. That was the research question. <clears throat> when I did some research on this, I came up with three main points. There was actually a lot, but I refined it down to three main points red, blue, and green. You can read them if you like, but this is part of why World War I really started World War II. Right? Those are my three main points. And so now I go back to the intro. There's the, the uh, research question. The hook, that thing to try to grab your attention. Devastating war, defected Europe, killing 23 million. Holy mackerel. Then thesis statement, results of the war, led directly to the outbreak of World War II. That was the purple piece. Okay. Now, let's finish up that intro. So there's the hook, there's the thesis statement in purple, and now you remember those three main points were in red, blue, and green. So I take one kind of key sentence, one idea, and it hints to the reader of what they're going to see in 
the body of the paper. So there's a good introduction right there. And now when I finish the intro, I move on to main point one, the Treaty of Versailles piece. So I did that here. Again, you don't have to read the whole thing, but it all the red goes to the idea of blame. And that came out of my um, my outline. Right? Legend, right? That's a German term for backstab. And so that's what I'm writing about here. <clears throat> the blue. Uh, this is a transition. The decay in national standing due to the blame, which I'd written about there, anger German people, not the only issue that moved Germany from the loser in World War One to the aggressor in World War Two. That's a transition sentence. So I finish up talking about the blame, and then I say, but you know what? There's another reason that moved us from World War One to World War Two, and that's where I go on to main point two. So that transition finishes up the one and kind of hints at preludes, preludes the uh, second main point or third main point. It's not required, but it is icing on the cake for really good writing. And there's a reference page for you. Oof. You can review these. Um, this is the last slide on the slides. I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, but to go through and make sure you've got this, uh, be a good prep for the uh, quiz number three, it'll be. Okay. Uh, and so look, I know, not the most exciting. But I promise, if you can put this, if you can start and then get better each time, if you can put writing where it's not this, oh my God, I hate it, big chip on your shoulder, you just knock it out, your life in college will be much easier. I promise you that. Okay, enough, right? <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to find the next uh, video and set of slides much more thought-provoking. I promise you will. So I will see you then.